The modern day equivalent of that is with SpaceX, who are doing similarly uh, impressive feats of engineering where they are managing to land two rockets that have just put a payload into orbit. And again, they've had some spectacular failures as they test in production, but ultimately they are achieving what it is they're trying to do. They're coming up with hypotheses around how can they actually get a rocket to land back on Earth or on a floating vessel. Um, and they're managing to do it because they're analyzing all the data that they would get even when it fails. When we then apply that to the world of programming and computer science and development, um, a lot of people, perhaps not here, but a lot of people do associate programming and developing with more of the craft-based approach, which is someone is given a specification of something that looks right, it feels right, and we go and build it, and it's a unique, bespoke thing that we as developers are doing. That in the industry, we perhaps should uh, approach this slightly more scientifically, which is using a hypothesis-driven development style, where we're actually, whether it's us or, or people who we're working with, uh, kind of setting out these requirements, have a scientific approach to what it is they want out of the feature that's being built, um, adding more value, improving performance, etc. But we actually need to understand what it is we're going to measure uh, and what it is the expected outcome is going to be. I'm not sure this term makes that much sense. If we are talking about having a more scientific approach, I feel it should be hypothesis-driven engineering, but the industry standard is development. Um, engineering implies a little more science than perhaps development does. So let's have a look at how we apply this up that way. So first up is the kind of the business hypothesis. So this is perhaps validation of an idea. And what this often looks like for us is an A-B test. So we would create a hypothesis that we can improve something, add more value to the site, what we're doing. We will split traffic between the variations that we have. We log absolutely everything we possibly can, all of the metrics, um, the exceptions, etc. We log all of that, we analyze that information, and at the end of it, we can then, in theory, validate that the hypothesis was correct or not. So the one I'm going to talk about is the Betway homepage. Um, which we will see in a minute, uh, this is a live A-B test, so this, this should be good. Um, so on the current homepage, I call it current, there are multiple ways that a user can get through to our registration form. What we found was number three is the least clicked of all these channels, but is the one that results in the most successful registrations. So the hypothesis from understanding that, well, was if we emphasize a single link on the homepage, there will be more registrations. And so we set about several months ago actually building a brand new application to be our brand new homepage to evaluate whether this hypothesis is correct or not. So right now there is a 50-50 split between these two homepages. If you wanted to, you could check it out on your phone and you would half the room in theory sees the left one and half the room in theory sees the right one. So how do we do this from an A-B test point of view? Well, first of all, we set a redirect up on the existing homepage. So on backway.com, we set a redirect up. Initially, it was only on for the devs and QAs who were building that new homepage. Once they were happy with it, we then turned it on for a few key members of the business who were going to check out whether it did everything that they wanted it to, whether it looked how they wanted it to. We then turned it on for 5% of our UK English language users. If that was all good, we then rolled it out to 25% and then 50%. And that's where we currently are with this. So this is the, the hypothesis was, this is by having one single bigger join now button, that is gonna generate more successful registrations for us. And what we have seen is in doing so, we have had 25% better successful, successful registration rate in the last six weeks of running this A-B test at 50-50. So the hypothesis has been proven for this business hypothesis. Alongside that, we have had some technical accomplishments as well. So with this project, we had no rollbacks, we have had no critical alerts or outages, and all of our de exceptions are decreasing over time. And um, this graph here shows how that's possible. Um, may not be great on the screen, it seems a bit dark. Um, but each line is a date since we've rolled this new homepage out. Each section of the bar graph is a different browser. And the, the, what we're seeing there is the number of exceptions per, brow, uh, per browser 
per day. What that allowed us to do is there are a couple of really tall spikes. That was edge. And we were able to turn the redirect off for the edge browser using feature toggles. And we could then fix the issue and then turn it back on for Edge, which is why we had no rollbacks with this, because we were completely in control of which of our users were getting this uh, new homepage. So we could turn it on or off for any of the browsers that we wanted to. So when I say 50-50, there are some slight caveats to that, where we are testing stuff and identifying things. But as you can see, the trend for the exception rate is decreasing. Um, I think towards the end, you actually see different blocks of um, colors appearing, and that's as we roll it out to more browsers that we were happy for them to start getting this A-B test. So now moving on to what I'm calling technical hypothesis, which is perhaps validation of an implementation. So this is perhaps technical debt, it is a performance improvement, it's a refactoring of something, so it's not necessarily going to add more business value, but technically we should be doing this. So one way that we can use feature toggling and, and um, basing this off like a hypothesis is we reckon that this is now going to be better for our implementation, but we aren't sure of that, so let's validate that, so let's roll it out. And we can roll out things based on any number of kind of um, targets here. These have all been used for various things that we've tested. Normally these have been for technical improvements as opposed to a new business kind of requested feature. We also are doing some cool stuff with being able to test slightly differently than we've been able to before. So the load testing one here, um, one of our new microservices has makes a number of calls to get content and they wanted to properly performance test this new microservice. But what they didn't want to do is hit any of the downstream content requests that they were making. They didn't want to put that load on them. So they actually encapsulated those calls in LaunchDarkly um, feature toggles. And then during the load test, it was only ever hitting a mock endpoint that just returned the data back from the app itself rather than hitting the real content endpoint. So we were able to put a shed load of load on the microservice without impacting any of the other apps downstream, which is really cool. Um, we're also able to, and I kind of showed this in that other graph, we can do testing on browsers and platforms and devices and networks, which that's quite a large um, kind of plethora of combinations. Doing that before you go live is actually extremely difficult, but once you're in production, you can start seeing in that graph where there are exceptions. And then you can just turn things on or off accordingly um, and fix things and then put it back live without really impacting users and without having the hassle of doing rollbacks and that kind of thing. So there are a few things that I just want to share from Betway's experience of doing hypothesis-driven development and testing in production. So what we have found is by using feature toggles, we can move to, for some teams, a trunk-based development startup. So they have stuff on their local machine and everything else goes to the master branch and goes to live. There is no other environment for them. And they're doing that by all of the new dev work that they're doing lives within a feature toggle. And it gets turned on only for them. And then once they're happy with it, they might share it with the product owner or whatever. Um, once they're happy with it, we can then start doing that kind of phased rollout to our users to see whether the feature is working as we expect it to. Um, this is saving a lot of time and hassle for some of our front-end teams because they don't have to go down the route of having lots and lots of issues with environments we have traditionally had in the past. Another thing that we have found is you, we find is that it's much better to track per device, not session. If a user comes to the site one day and sees a feature A, and then they come back another day and see feature B, and come back another day and see feature A, it feels a bit weird for them that they're seeing this feature time and time again. So we track on devices. Um, once they're logged in, we will then track them by their username, but some of our users perhaps just look at our pages logged out to see what the latest odds are or whatever. Um, we also have a shared cookie across a number of our applications if we want to have features that are across different applications and front-end um, services, then we can use that. One thing that is coming to light more as we are doing more um, feature toggling with testing in production is what I'm calling scheduling complacency, which is where a number of teams are working on a full end-to-end -end project. We might go ahead and do the work. You can't actually read all that. Okay. It says we, and then at the end it says uh, for. Um, 
if you couldn't figure that out. Uh, so we find that because some parts of the business know that we can turn a feature on or off very easily, they request us to do the work, we go ahead and do the work, we turn it on, and then we discover sometime later, oh no, but the downstream system wasn't ready for that yet. Um, can you turn it off, please? We turn it off, and then weeks go by and just, we've done the work a long time ahead of everyone else, which is a bit of a pain because we think, well, we could have worked on something else then. So that's a tip to just be aware of because once people know you can turn things on or off, they'll make use of that. <laughs> Uh, this one's a slightly different use case for testing in production, which is possibly not really testing in production, but it's making use of a permanent toggle. All of the other toggles that I've kind of spoken about are more for features or rollouts rather than something that's going to live on forever. But what we can do is when we um, have minified and unminified versions of our JavaScript on site, we can actually turn um, a toggle on for specific users within our network that will re return the unminified version of the JavaScript. So if we're trying to debug an issue, it's much easier to do it with the unminified rather than the minified. This kind of stuff makes that much easier for us. So it's still the production environment, still the production site, but you're getting the, the unminified version. And then there are a couple of things when it comes to actually using Hypothesis and um, working with them is, this might sound very obvious, but we have found a number of instances where people's expectations of what success looked like for uh, an experiment was not the same. And so what we found is it's really good to set a goal with everyone who's involved in the project so that we all understand what that goal is and we can agree on what the metrics are for that goal. And also having an understanding of what success and failure would look like, because sometimes it might not be a failure um, for some people and other people it would be. So again, agreeing what that really looks like is really useful. And on the same kind of theme, understanding what the sample is going to be for the experiment. Our assumptions are not always the same as what the business are going to assume when they request the feature. Um, and so asking these kinds of questions has certainly helped us in the past. What we have then done with those kind of things in mind is we've started to use what we're calling a hypothesis specification, which is, is a document that goes over all of those kinds of things, makes us think about them. We used to use this uh, a fair amount, but we don't use it so much now because it kind of, we're in that way of thinking, so we don't always have to use this. Um, but it has helped us to make sure everyone's on the same page. Um, we are making that available if anyone is interested in that, or making it as a basis for your own. Hopefully that, work, that link works. Fingers crossed. Um, so, in summary, we're trying to use hypothesis-driven engineering wherever we can because we're finding it's giving us much better, um, valuable information about what our users are actually doing, what our, technically what our apps are doing, and it means we're not having to do so many things of rolling back and things that you just don't want to do. So that would be the, the, the thing that I think is to take away is to try and have a slightly more hypothesis-driven engineering approach to the way in which we're developing software. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Are we in questions now? Yeah. Are there any questions? Don't forget to repeat it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Did you, did you automate the transitions from when you were scaling out the, the release of that, of the test, of going from 5 and 10 and 25, or were you, and, and I guess, how did you determine whether or not everything was okay for you? So the question was, did we automate the transitions when we rolled out the A-B tests for the homepage? Uh, no, that was all manual. So we, we were checking the data ourselves, analyzing what the logs were telling us. It was mostly based on the number of kind of exceptions that we were seeing and the click-through rate on the button. And as long as that was kind of in line with what we wanted and it was no worse than the existing homepage, then we, were, we felt confident to keep going with it. Is that part of your hypothesis spec? The follow-on was, was that part of the hypothesis spec, and it, it can be included in there. Um, and again, it's kind of that conversation to make sure everyone's aligned. If that's the, the, the way in which we wanted to go with it, then it would be something that we would include there. Yeah. Uh, it was really interesting. Thanks for uh, one of the comments you were making about how uh, once other people in the business can realize you can turn things on and off, they like, you know, you do all the work and then they, uh, on and off occasionally. I'm kind of 
curious, is have you found like this hypothesis stuff like quite localized to your team, or like has it spread throughout the company? And if it hasn't spread throughout the company, what is stopping other people from what do you what do you feel is stopping other people from adopting this within your company? So uh, the question is, uh, is this just for the team, or is this is hypothesis driven engineering more for the entire company? And if it's not yet for the company, why? Um, it's very much within the department. Some of our closest stakeholders kind of are beginning to understand the way in which we work. The business expectation is pretty much that we'll always have feature toggles on anything new we do, but they don't necessarily think through what the success would look like, which is, that's caught us out before. So we do try and work with them to make sure that happens. So there is an understanding, but they probably wouldn't look at it quite how we look. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, for, for our stakeholders at least, anyway. Yes? How do you manage the kind of rollout of these features, or the toggling of the features, or incrementing the subset of users that are, that are using that feature? Do you kind of collaborate with your business users and figure out a good time to do that, or is it is it easier than that? So the question is kind of how do we schedule the incre incrementing the, the rollout? That does come up at the kind of the hypothesis specification kind of conversations, but ultimately the stakeholders just want that feature in theory to be live as to 50-50 as quickly as possible. So it's slightly more for us to just validate that things are looking okay and we can do it on our own timeline. Any other questions? Cool. Thank you.